Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unchained Capital's webinar series. Our goal is to provide educational content for clients exclusively on these live webinars to help you become sovereign in your Bitcoin wealth. My name is Justine Harper, and I'm the VP of Concierge at Unchained Capital, and I'm joined by Parker Lewis, our Head of Business Development at Unchained, as well as author of the Gradually Then Suddenly series. Today, he will be sharing with you his Bitcoin in one lesson a guide to help you not only understand the fundamentals of Bitcoin in a simple and easy to understand way, but also to become a resource that you can share with friends, family, and colleagues to help them fall down the Bitcoin rabbit hole as well. We are gonna have a QA and a section after um, Parker does his full guide. So make sure you're using the Q&A section to drop those in and I will be monitoring those and feeding them to Parker a little bit later. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Parker Lewis. Thanks, Justine. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, kind of before we dive right into the presentation, I always find it helpful to, to set some context. This is really a presentation that I've developed over the last six to nine months, just really on an ad hoc basis where I didn't actually have a presentation in front of me. Um, I gave it for the first time around Bitblock Boom, which is the Bitcoin conference in Dallas. Um, so this will be my second time giving this presentation, but first time in this format. And what I what I oftentimes find to be most helpful is uh, I'm going to try to get through this presentation, which is about uh, 10 or 11 slides in uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And then it's uh, what I've also found very helpful is, is that we have a, a lot of Q&A that um, what this presentation is designed to do is to help people um, who don't yet understand Bitcoin um, develop a fundamental understanding. You're not going to get uh, all the way down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, but what we try to, to establish here is the right framework to think about it um, and to get somebody from zero to, to understanding that Bitcoin isn't just some magic digital internet money, uh, that there's a lot to it and that we build up the, the economic framework to then go deeper down the, the rabbit hole. So um, when I generally start, um, I start with my story about how I came to Bitcoin. I, and I really try to distill down um, for folks, um, is, is start with my story of how I started to understand Bitcoin, because I think that when um, a lot of people come into Bitcoin for the first time, uh, there's a thousand different cryptocurrencies and, and they don't really know uh, where to start. And so really in 2016, when I was, uh, when I was in earnest uh, for the first time trying to understand Bitcoin, I was really pursuing two different paths. I was, um, I was working at a hedge fund in Dallas uh, called Heyman Capital run by uh, an investor um, best known for shorting the subprime crisis, Kyle Bass. And uh, I was trying to understand what would happen when the Fed began to unwind its balance sheet. Um, over the course of 2009 to 2014, post the financial crisis, the um, Federal Reserve digitally created or printed 3.6 trillion new dollars. Um, in the 2016-2017 timeframe, they were starting to talk about how they were going to unwind the quantitative easing of the dollars that they had printed and put in the financial system. And through that process, I, I went down a, a deep rabbit hole of trying to understand the actual mechanics of quantitative easing. And, and what I, the conclusion I came to independent of Bitcoin was that quantitative easing doesn't work in the context that the Fed thinks it does. It can't work in the future quantitative easing is inevitable. Um, a lot of people that have experienced the last, uh, 18 months and seeing that the Fed and we'll get into the, to the size and magnitude, uh, they've printed another 4.7 trillion since, since last March. Um, they think that it has something to do with COVID. Uh, and they think that, that the government shutdown or the pandemic was the reason why this happened. But realistically, um, it, the, the, the amount of money that the Fed has to print uh, was always due to the degrees of system leverage and, and that QE only can can function by creating more leverage, uh, not less. As I was coming to that conclusion, I started to understand uh, why Bitcoin was valuable. And, and, I, and I really try to focus people on this one point um, and that I stared at Bitcoin for a long time without it making sense. Um, but I really had to learn for the first time what makes money money. And that, that if I was to distill for folks why Bitcoin is valuable, it all comes down to the fact that there are 21 million Bitcoin and there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. And that all value derives from the fact that um, Bitcoin's true innovation, it's zero to one innovation, is that it was able to achieve finite scarcity in digital form. And there's a reason why 
no other cryptocurrency or no other money will be able to achieve the same. Um, but I go so far as to say, and, and this is also to distill down for folks the real signal, it's not to say that this is intended to be intuitive right away, but that it's if Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, that it will become a global reserve currency, um, whether it's alongside the dollar or entirely replacing the dollar or the dollar euro yen, um, that, that, that what I try to focus people on is that that is, is the really, that, that's the fulcrum, the 21 million. Uh, but I would also say, you know, or clarify when I say that if Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, that it will become a global reserve currency, the reverse is also true. That if Bitcoin cannot credibly enforce a fixed supply of 21 million, that it won't, that it's binary. And that, that the key to understanding Bitcoin is the key to understanding how that's possible, the 21 million, and, and why it's relevant. Why, if it were possible, that it would be the foundation for a global monetary system. Um, and, and really, as I, as I kind of came to these two conclusions, on the one hand, that QE is inevitable uh, and future QE is inevitable in, in the order of magnitude of trillions of dollars. Also pairing with the understanding of, of why Bitcoin has fundamental value, why, why people, you know, beyond speculative and FOMO reasons, why, why the people that search for the signal ultimately find it and that it is 21 million, I started to understand that, that Bitcoin is the solution to quantitative easing. Um, that, that prior to Bitcoin's existence, everyone was really forced to opt in to uh, the government or the Federal Reserve, even though they're two distinct entities, um, functionally they are one and the same, that everyone was forced to opt in to the form of currency that coordinates its monetary system um, to be debased um, against their will. Uh, and that, that Bitcoin provides a path to, to voluntarily opt out and to opt in to a currency system that has a fixed supply. And to, to really distill this point down, I, I, I highlight the 13 weeks, you know, the two weeks prior to the COVID shutdown, which happened on March 12th, um, and then, and then the, the uh, 11 weeks thereafter. And what I have here on this table is the amount of Bitcoin that were issued each week and the amount of dollars that the Fed digitally created. And, you know, kind of to highlight, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to, to, to learn from this one slide. Uh, when I started doing this presentation, I would just sit on this one slide and then, and then, and then uh, run off the cuff to explain the rest. But what I highlight for folks is when I say that future QE is inevitable, it's that uh, prior to the, the government shutdown, the Fed was already printing 82 billion and 70 billion a week. Uh, and at the height of post-financial crisis quantitative easing, uh, they were pro, uh, printing 85 billion a month. So the, the money printing had already started and it already started because the financial system had, had displayed its fragility and its imbalance about six months prior in, in September of 2019. Um, but then what we see post COVID is that the Fed printed 356 billion in the next week, 586 billion, 557 billion. The entire, over the course of 2010 and 2011, which is generally referred to as quantitative easing two, that second round, the Fed printed 600 billion over the course of about 18 months. And in one week, the Fed printed 586 billion. Um, that, that ultimately, uh, there's a lot of macro investors that will you know, talk about trends in, in the global supply chain and, and M2 growth and M1 growth, different ways to quantify um, the, the money supply in the United States. Base money drives everything. What we, what we have here on the right side are actually new dollars being created in the system. And ultimately, this is what drives higher food prices at the grocery shelf, higher gas prices at uh, the gasoline station. This is what this is the this is where all inflation derives from that it's man-made, uh, and that that everyone has this problem. Everyone in the United States has this problem. They have this problem now. It's acute. Most people don't understand it, uh, but everyone realistically has has this problem that they don't have a good form of money. On the left side or the middle column, we see the Bitcoin issue, and we can obviously see that the numbers are significantly smaller. But but something critical happens in the towards the bottom of the page in during the week of, of May 20th. It actually happened in, in the week prior, but this is where you start to see the numbers that the rate of issuance gets cut in half. And I'm not going to go into all the details as to how Bitcoin credibly enforces its fixed supply, but but this is core to it. That every four years the rate of issuance gets cut in half. Um, you don't have to trust any central third party that that will happen. Um, it's not enforced by um, 
magic internet code. It's enforced by economic incentives and enforced by the Bitcoin network. Um, going to the next slide. This is where I, where I just tried to, to reinforce for, for, for folks that uh, the problem is massive. Um, trillions of dollars are, are, are numbers that are realistically uh, too hard for us to, to, to quantify or understand. Um, what, I, what I try to throw out for people to, to, to ground it is on the prior slide when, when I showed that in, in a course of three months, the Federal Reserve printed $3 trillion. Um, realistically, since this latest round of quantitative easing started at $4.7 trillion, that's, all, that's more than, than post-financial crisis QE. Over five years, um, the Federal Reserve created $3.6 trillion. Since uh, September of 2019, it was $4.7 trillion. Over the course of those three months, it was three. But even this year, when we're all seemingly, quote, not in an economic crisis, the Federal Reserve has printed $1.1 trillion. Um, not only is that a lot of money, but, but if you think about just 1.1 trillion, um, I, I usually use the analogy, um, I'm, I'm generally speaking to an audience in Texas, but most people are familiar with the Dallas Cowboys and Jerry World, and that stadium costs a billion dollars to, to, uh, to build. And that billion dollars coordinated economic activity over the course of six years. Um, it's one of the nicest football stadiums at the time, it was the nicest football stadium that existed in America. Um, and there's only a maximum of 32 football stadiums that exist. Well, a trillion dollars equates to a thousand Jerry Worlds. Uh, and that's what's been flooded into the system um, just in the first nine months of this year. But on top of that, the three trillion last year was 3,000 Jerry Worlds. But there's massive economic consequences to these um, operations that the Federal Reserve affects. And realistically, that the actual insertion of QE only dictates that the Fed is going to to do more QE in the future. And a lot of times when people start to learn about Bitcoin, they think if they're in the United States or Europe or some other developed world, that they don't have the same problem that people have in, in the developing world in terms of currency crisis. They think uh, Venezuela has a hyperinflation. That's not my problem. This is different. Realistically, uh, it's the same. And these numbers are what help articulate for people that they have a clear and present danger in terms of, of the currency that they hold. Um, and so when, when, I, when I say that, that we have a problem, we have a massive problem, we have trillion dollar problems, um, but that, that Bitcoin um, is the solution to those problems. There's a reality that most people have never consciously considered why dollars in the first place have value or retain value or why they lose value. Um, that is because most people have never actually um, consciously considered what money is. And, and the thing that I focus people on here is that in order to understand Bitcoin, you can't come at it from the top down. You can't come at it from the perspective that there's a thousand cryptocurrencies and I'm going to try to understand, you know, one currency from the other. Um, the statement that I will repeat over and over during this presentation is if Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, that it will become a global reserve currency. Um, but that has very little to do with Bitcoin itself and everything to do with money. And that's really why if you want to understand Bitcoin, you first have to spend time thinking about this question of what is money? Why do 325 million people in the United States accept dollars that the, that the government can print um, as, as re in return for real goods and services? Um, and, and what I highlight here, and this isn't for you to immediately have this make sense. Uh, but it is, it is to establish, in my view, what the key monetary properties are that, uh, that you should be thinking about, because money never competes in a vacuum. You're not just evaluating Bitcoin as a standalone. If I would try to understand Bitcoin as a standalone, not relative to other forms of money, it would have never made sense. And that's, that's realistically not what's happening in the market. People, uh, when they start to evaluate money, they realize that money serves a very distinct function from every other economic good, from, from financial assets, from real goods and services, that money has a unique function of coordinating activity and specifically um, helping to intermediate and make trade more efficient. And that when you get into this um, kind of evaluation of, of why is the dollar value, why is money valuable, you will start to, to understand that the three key properties that make something a better or worse form of money or scarcity. Uh, one, uh, that really is the foundation of store value. 
it should be intuitive to folks that if they could be compensated for eight hours in the day and that their employer could just print more money, um, that that wouldn't, that, that, that would not be a good equation for you. That's effectively what happens. It just happens at the government level. The second is the visibility and fungibility. Um, this is what allows you to, to actually use a, a, a scarce unit to, to measure, but then aggregate and, and subdivide so that you could use in one medium uh, to value and trade uh, a bottle of water as well as the Dallas Cowboys. Um, but then the third, if, 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 the, if the purpose of money is to affect trade, you actually have to transfer that, that common medium that people use as money, um, but that it's not any one of these properties. If you have something that's scarce, it doesn't make it money. Um, if you have something that's scarce and divisible and fungible, it doesn't make something viable or valuable as money. You have to have the aggregate of all three. And that when you get into this equation, you're going to start to understand that no two things are remotely similar. Um, and that one money will not displace another money if it's just marginally better. It has to be uh, orders of magnitude better. Um, but, but the key point that I make is, and I think that if you practice this in your daily lives, if you ask people what makes the dollar valuable or what makes gold valuable, um, you know, but, but focusing on the dollar, they will say that, that it's either a collective hallucination or it's a belief system or it's because the government requires taxes or there's the military. It's none of those things. The value of money derives from specific properties that make it valuable in the context of trade. Um, and so when I distill down this equation, it's, there's, there's really two things to consider. Um, and again, this, this is designed to simplify Bitcoin for folks, there's a lot more to it, but this is really to open people up to the possibility of, of why people fundamentally value Bitcoin. And, and in a world of a thousand cryptocurrencies, how is it possible to know either which one wins or if there even is a way to know? And so the, the, the two key elements for this is that Bitcoin's fixed supply is 21 million. If it were to be true that that could happen, uh, and, and, and it's timely because Jamie Dimon came out yesterday and said, you know, I just, I, I don't believe it, the 21 million. Have you looked at the algorithm? Uh, but the reality is there is a way to know. You're not gonna get that in a 30 minute presentation for me, but, but what we're trying to do here is distill down the decision points. And, and, and there's a reality that when you start to evaluate money and, and coming back to that scarcity equation, uh, that there can be nothing better than something that doesn't change. Uh, sometimes people will jump to the conclusion and say, well, wouldn't it be better for me to have a currency that actually slightly declines uh, in, in you know, supply? Uh, no, the optimal po monetary policy is one that, that actually cannot change. Because if you were to think about, well, what happens if a currency were to decline in supply, you would have to answer the question, well, by what mechanism does that happen? Who's, who, which holder of the currency gets their money taken away from them? Uh, and it becomes arbitrary. That, that the neutral monetary supply, the fixed monetary supply, is the optimal money supply. And think about it in an individual case. If I was to re receive payment in the form of money, what would I prefer? Would I prefer something that can't change or something that could be printed by a currency because always, rem or sorry, printed by a government? Because always remember that money is an A-B test. You're always, every form of money competes with every other form of money for every exchange. And, and you're making this, this conscious decision either well, truthfully, consciously or subconsciously every day but that 21 million fixed supply is the optimal monetary policy. And that when I said before, that if that is true, that Bitcoin will become a global reserve currency, it is because money converges to one based on its natural function. Now, I, I tend to stop people here before I go to the next slide and I say, hey, there's a lot, that, lot to unpackage. There's a lot that, you, that you're going to have to question about this. And, and, and really the questions that I laid out here um, are the questions that, that are most pertinent. It is, is Bitcoin actually finitely scarce? How? Um, if so, is that finite scarcity viable and valuable as money? Why can't Bitcoin be copied? There's a thousand different cryptocurrencies. Do monetary systems converge to one? That these are the questions to work through to distill down. Um, and, and also I try to frame for people that these, are, these questions are answerable questions by, uh, but by, by, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. In fact, oftentimes Ryan, rocket scientists can't figure this out, that it's more questions of common sense than it is uh, a one of IQ. Um, here, you know, I kind of, you know, to answer this first question, how does Bitcoin enforce a fixed supply? This is the hardest question. 
this is actually the question that if you're trying to understand why Bitcoin is valuable, this is, the, this is actually the second to come to because it's the hardest. Uh, and, and what I tell people is that it's like, accept that it's, value, that it's difficult. Uh, appreciate the context that a lot of people have come and stared at this equation. There's a, there's a saying in Bitcoin, uh, verify, don't trust. But, but trust me as to the, uh, the, the cadence of the questions to ask. Um, accept that it's not magic or voodoo or just simply by chance. Um, and then, you know, at this level, I, I really focus people on that it's a combination of energy, computing, cryptography, distributed systems, and economic incentives. But that Bitcoin, the currency itself, is the keystone that binds everything together. It's really the glue uh, that, that, that aligns all economic incentives and ensures that, uh, that no one has to trust anyone else, that this is enforced on a trustless basis by the aggregate network. Um, but then I come back to what I said at the beginning of the slide, which is before question the how, first understand the why. Um, so, so it's essentially jump ahead, ask yourself a question, or go through the rigor on the, on the monetary side to say, if Bitcoin did have a fixed supply of 21 million, would that be valuable? Because if you stare at that equation and come to the conclusion that it would not, then the question about how becomes irrelevant. Uh, but if you come to the conclusion that if it were possible, then the other questions become relevant to you. Um, to support this idea, again, because it's not particularly, um, it's not particularly intuitive that, that money converges to one. And there's a lot to unpackage there. But, but really where I focus people at the beginning to, to try to understand that that actually is the case or that it's even a possibility, oftentimes people will look at the dollar, the euro, the yen, uh, the boulevard, the peso, the pound, um, the rei, lira, whatever currency, and they say there's a lot of fiat currencies. Of course, there's going to be a lot of cryptocurrencies. Um, but the reality is each one of those fiat currencies that I just listed off emerged off of the monetary properties of gold or silver, other, some other commodity money. Um, but, but more practically, the world converged on the gold standard over the course of thousands of years. And the question that you have to ask yourself is why was that the case and was it, because, was it by coincidence? And I, and I say that knowing that most people do not understand why gold is money or, or why it emerged as, as the global standard of value. But it did and people have to accept that it wasn't just by mere coincidence. Of all the things in the world, why did the entire world converge on gold as a monetary standard? And that the, that the various different forms of fiat money that exist today only exist in large part because they leverage the monetary properties of commodity monies, particularly that of gold, that the dollar itself does not have any inherent monetary properties. Second, because this is something to, important to demystify, it is the world of a thousand cryptocurrencies. Why only one? Well, even if you don't understand the fundamentals of money just yet, you can appreciate that if you think about your own individual life, as well as the lives of everyone around the world, uh, that 99.9% .9 of people in the world, of the, of the 8 billion people, they only interact with one form of money, if they're lucky to interact with a form of money at all. Uh, and then the question to ask is, why and is it by coincidence? It is, it is not by coincidence. It's inherent to the problem that money solves and that convergence doesn't happen by coincidence, it happens by necessity. Um, but, it's, but it's particularly because of the, of the problem that money solves uh, and that in order to solve it, it dictates uh, that, that everyone converge on a consensus, at least on a local level and then on a broader level beyond that. But more, but more realistically, if everyone access, has access to a better form of money and Bitcoin is global and permissionless and censorship resistant, that the world will converge on it. And that's what's happening uh, as we speak. Um, but now kind of to come back to, to a key idea. So everything about this presentation is to, to still down for you, the ideas to think about as you're evaluating this thing, Bitcoin makes zero sense. There's a world of cryptocurrencies. There's a bunch of fanboys and, and uh, they're overly confident. Uh, the majority of those people have no idea what they're doing. So we can, we can agree on that but that there is signal to find through the noise. Um, and that to distill it down, it's the 21 million, it's that money converges to one, but it's this recognition that 
money is an A B test. That 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 you make this decision every day where you have dollars, you know they're devaluing, and you're choosing some other near store of value. And today it might be a financial asset or real estate, but you're making certain decisions because you know that the money that you're holding isn't very good and that it's engineered to, to lose its value. You either understand that at the Fed's level or you understand it in practice by seeing local prices increase over time. Um, but this, in the A-B test of money, it really comes down to monetary issuance uh, and that foundation of money, which is scarcity. And this is my fool me once, I refer to this as fool me once, shame on you, fool me four times, shame on me. That, that if QE was effective, and, and I understand that QE is a complicated subject, but all it is is the government printing trillions of dollars. That the QE1, QE2, and QE3 on this slide were post-financial crisis 2008, 9 through 14. Uh, but if QE worked, why do they always need another round? And why is the next one always bigger? Um, there is a reason is because quantitative easing for it to work in the Fed's context, it has to take a situation where you have a credit problem, uh, an unsustainable credit system, that QE is specifically designed to cause the expansion of credit. Um, and that will continue to be the case until the entire system actually collapses. Um, and that, that, that part of that evidence is now, um, and we can go back to a, a, a podcast that I did with uh, Marty Bent and my former boss, Kyle Bass, um, that was that was prior to all of this, that uh, that that I forecasted that this round of QE would have to be larger than the last round of QE. And it is because at the last round of QE, the credit system in the United States was 53 trillion. Today, it's 85 trillion. That it's the size of the credit system that dictates that this money be printed because it's designed to keep that credit system propped up. Um, I also highlight on this slide um, what Paul Tudor Jones said, because there's certain concepts in the, slide, in, the, in the slide deck that I'll continue to bring up. There's the fact that it's 21 million, that everything hinges on that 21 million fixed supply, that money converges to one. Um, but that I like to show people that when people actually look at Bitcoin on a fundamental level and when they ultimately find the signal, that it is this, this key idea of looking at Bitcoin versus the dollars, that the context is not Bitcoin versus a thousand cryptocurrencies. It is Bitcoin vis-a-vis other forms of money that you previously owned. And so what Paul Tudor Jones said was, this is from May of 2020 when he announced that he had, that he had allocated um, to, to Bitcoin and his primary funds was, and he's describing quantitative easing, that first slide that I showed you, the weekly amount of money that was printed, he described it as, it has happened globally with such speed that even a market veteran like myself was left speechless. We are witnessing the great monetary inflation, an unprecedented expansion of every form of money unlike anything the developed world has ever seen. And then when he, Paul Tudor Jones again in the same letter when he's describing why he decided to allocate to Bitcoin, it is, I also made the case for owning Bitcoin, the quintessence of scarcity premium. It is literally the only large tradable asset in the world that has a known fixed maximum supply. By its design, the total quantity of Bitcoins, including those not yet mined, cannot exceed 21 million. That, that these are the two things that everyone in the United States plus the world has a problem and it derives from the fact that there is economic stability originating from printing money and there's no escaping it. That quantitative easing is more like heroin than it is an antibiotic. It actually can't cure the patient. It's just giving the heroin addict more heroin. Uh, Bitcoin is the solution. It's the solution because anyone in the world uh, that has an internet connection and realistically, you know, it's easier for someone to adopt Bitcoin in the United States or, or, or a developed world, but it will be uh, the entire world. And practically speaking, anyone that wants to work for it can get it anywhere in the world. Uh, but the value, and this is a demonstration, this blue line is the 21 million supply. The, uh, the orange line that steps down is the rate of issuance. Um, I think I originally took this chart from about a year ago when the Bitcoin happening happened, but recognizing that every four years approximately, um, the rate of issuance gets cut in half. There is no central committee that decides that. Um, the network enforces those rules and everyone can credibly rely on it without the need for trust. And that it really doesn't re require a rocket science. Rocket scientists, it requires someone to look at this equation, the A, B, a test of money, and understand that this is going to continue to happen um, and, that, and that this is credibly enforced. It's credibly enforced every 10 minutes. 
people particularly see it when the when the rate of issuance happens. But but practically speaking, um, Bitcoin on a decentralized basis is credibly enforcing its fixed supply uh, around the clock. Um, ultimately, though, and I like to kind of bring these two together. If money is an A/B test, that the the actual demonstration of that or, or the best way to see what the consensus is, is the price. Um, now, while I envision a world where, where Bitcoin will likely replace all fiat currencies and, and the this unit of account will be Bitcoin and will be buying groceries probably in 10 years in Bitcoin and gas and Bitcoin, that as we see Bitcoin emerge as the consensus, that was, we see more people stare at this equation. The amount of dollars being printed understanding of, of the, the supply curve of Bitcoin and that it's finitely fixed, um, that they come to the conclusion that they should own Bitcoin, that they should store value in Bitcoin. And that in the AB test of money, monetary properties, remember that slide where I had scarcity, divisibility, and fungibility, and transferability. Those are the inputs and price is the output. Uh, and there's a reason why every time that you see, quote, Bitcoin crash, uh, that it doesn't die because more people stare at this equation, more people find the signal through the noise, uh, and that increase in purchasing, purchasing power is the clearest signal of growing adoption. If there's a fixed supply, if there's, if there's a, a fixed supply and a fixed rate of issuance, that when the, the demand increases by 10x, no, it doesn't pull forward uh, any additional supply. You can't find more, uh, but that the existing supply has to get carved up by more and more people. Um, by that function, is, it, it is what causes the price to go up. But, but that price going up is the, is the most clear demonstration. It's the market test. It's everyone has to evaluate these, or at least the early adopters. The, the laggards, the, 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 the next 90%, I like to tell people that you don't have to understand how telecom works to use the telephone. That will be the case for, for the last 90% of people that adopt Bitcoin in the world. Uh, the first 10% or maybe even fewer than that, maybe the first 5%, they're the ones that if they're going to be the first adopters and the early adopters, they have to evaluate the monetary um, dilemma, the monetary properties that are the input. But, but that as that price goes up, it's that signal and the signal that you should take away from it is it's not a financial asset. It's more people coming to the conclusion that Bitcoin is the consensus as a new global standard of value. Um, the quote that I always like to highlight on this for people from Safe Dean and Moose's The Bitcoin Standard, which I recommend everyone read, is history shows it is not possible to insulate yourself from the consequences of others holding money that is harder than yours. So this is, you know, the, the story I like to, to analogize this to is the kid that plays hide and seek and covers up his eyes, but everyone that's searching for him knows that the kid's in the corner. He doesn't understand that. In, in this context, if you ignore this question, Everybody else who's finding the signal before you will benefit um, and, and that, that you will actually be penalized. You will, you will lose the game. And, and that's why I describe you know, Bitcoin as the greatest asymmetry that has ever existed. No one that's alive today and realistically no one that's ever been alive has experienced the monetization event that will occur as rapidly as Bitcoin. And so I show this chart on the right side. And I would estimate, I think if you, you can pull different places, you see estimates that maybe 150 million people have Bitcoin. Uh, but in terms of any material exposure to Bitcoin, which I generally refer to as five to 10% of their savings or, or liquid assets, um, that, that no, no more than 10 million people have Bitcoin. In the future, seven to 8 billion people are gonna have Bitcoin. Um, and that, that that creates a significant degree of positive asymmetry. That are, if, you are, if you are finding the signal before uh, the herd, that, that your purchasing power will increase significantly. Uh, that won't always be the case in Bitcoin. Once Bitcoin is adopted by probably a billion people, it will likely be the, the, the standard unit of account uh, and that you won't be in a position where the incremental marginal demand for Bitcoin can be more than a few percentage points than uh, the existing base because the first billion to adopt Bitcoin will also be the, those that have the most wealth. Um, but the greatest asymmetry that's ever existed is not just because it's the first time in rapid form that, that a good is monetizing on the free market. It's because there's massive negative asymmetry to holding a form of money that's being demonetized. If money is an A-B test and you're always evaluating one money versus the other and every exchange 
uh, every form of money is competing for every exchange, that when one money monetizes, it's necessarily demonetizing another. Um, and some people see that the price of Bitcoin has gone up from 1,000 about four or five years ago to 57,000-ish today, and see that Bitcoin is appreciated in value, but realistically the dollar buys more or, or buys less Bitcoin. And that will continue to be the case as more and more people in the world demand what is a finitely scarce asset. Um, so before I go into, you know, at the end, I'll talk about what we do at Unchained, but I want to pause there, ran a little bit long, uh, but want to open it up to questions. Absolutely. And that was great. Thank you, Parker. Um, I think everybody's been holding and waiting for this Q&A section. So you guys can drop those in the chat or in the Q&A. It could be about specifically anything that Parker talked about today, preferably. Um, but if you have questions for Parker as well, um, I haven't seen any come in yet. So we'll just kind of wait here for just a minute to see if any others come through. Looks good on my end that you guys should be able to chat um, in both the Q&A and the chat section specifically. Um, so Dylan and David have a few questions. I'll just read those to you first as we wait on a few others. Dylan asked, what is the catalyst for QA to stop working in your opinion? So I think that it's, the timing is impossible to predict, um, but that I would say there's a, there's, there's a dynamic relationship between, um, between Bitcoin adoption and QE's effectiveness that once a critical mass of people are operating in the, in the Bitcoin monetary system and they're essentially free from the, um, from the legacy system, those people do not have to demand dollars. The demand for dollars is what allows, the demand from dollars in terms of like what holds the system together is the fact that there's $85 trillion of credit and only about $7 trillion. Um, but the system, while a lot of central bankers will look at it in aggregate, there's people that, that don't really need dollars or they don't need a significant share because they're, they're not uh, wed to that credit system. They're not in debt. So as people figure out Bitcoin and start to sell financial assets to buy Bitcoin, uh, to basically move out of monetary substitutes into Bitcoin or just transfer their dollars into Bitcoin, that that will actually cause an acceleration of, it will impair the credit complex. It will cause the acceleration of the, um, the demise of the credit system. But through that, the Fed will have to print more and more money. As the Fed prints more and more money, it becomes less effective. Uh, it becomes less effective because more people like Paul Tudor Jones, like myself, like pretty much everyone that works at Unchained Capital, as, a, as is anybody who's figured out Bitcoin, uh, sees that, that, it, that it's not just a fool me once type scenario, that it's going to keep happening and that it's their problem. Um, and so I think that like what we've seen is in this round of QE, it's far less effective, but that there's also this idea and it will continue to be far less effective until it just breaks one day. And that's, that's when hyperinflation occurs. But what I, what I you know, point people to, the hyperinflation, which will be the sign that, um, that, that the dollar has failed and the QE has stopped working, um, it doesn't just happen as a function of printing money. It happens because the actual printing of money, what it functionally does is it takes a, a system of imbalance, um, which was, I like to just simplify that for people, Imagine the housing market in 2007 and eight. The housing market had imbalance, prices were too high. Um, as the price started to come down for, for housing generally, the Fed stepped in and bought over a trillion dollars of, of mortgage-backed securities to prop up the value of housing. They actively worked against free market forces to allow imbalance to be sustained. The function of allowing imbalance to be sustained is allowing supply chains to ultimately exist that couldn't otherwise be sustained. And you will ultimately start, and we're starting to see it now, but this is ultimately what happens in currencies that, that hyperinflate. It's that as more and more money becomes abundant, the real goods and services that people need become actually scarce and the whole function of money breaks down. Um, the example that I, I use for people is Venezuela. GM used to manufacture cars in Venezuela. Um, they in 2014 or 2015 had to write down $500 million of Venezuelan boulevards ultimately to zero, and then they couldn't, they could no longer import parts uh, from their suppliers to build cars, and, and the system continues. So it's not just a function of printing money, it's that the printing of money allows imbalance to be sustained, and then once something breaks in the supply chain, it, um, it gets exacerbated. 
So um, the timing is impossible to predict, but, but we already are seeing QE be less effective today, requiring that they need more, and also seeing supply chains start to break down. So I would probably forecast over the next 10 years that, that QE becomes totally inept and, and not functional. Awesome. And we've got a lot of really good questions um, coming in. One that was specifically asked a little bit early, and this is kind of very, it's a very speculative question, is do you have any opinion on what countries you may see adopting Bitcoin in the future next? Is there one that you sort of have your eye on that you think would be doing so in the way that we've seen um, El Salvador do? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll jump into that. Uh, there was another question maybe we can handle next I just happened to see, which was uh, Bitcoin numbers may be finite, but there are thousands of cryptocurrencies and more being added to be akin to the Fed printing money. Maybe if we just could come back to that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also for, for folks that are on the call, um, I'm going to stay beyond the hour. A lot of people will have to jump. That's kind of what we originally set up. But for folks that uh, want to join or stay and continue to ask questions, I'm, I'm here as a resource. Um, but in terms of other countries that, that adopt Bitcoin next, like I'd say at the sovereign level, um, the Ukraine has re recently um, signaled that, that, you know, kind of made a forward statement that, that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is illegal. Um, it is a key NATO ally. So seeing what happens with, with Ukraine and seeing that they're taking that forward action, it's, it's, it's beyond just, um, you know, or, or it's not yet at the point of, of making it legal tender, but the fact that at the sovereign level, they're substantiating, hey, no, this, this currency is good and legal here, um, or, or at least it's not illegal, I think is the Ukraine is one country to, to look out for. Um, Brazil is another country. Um, again, I, I find it a little bit futile to, to, pre to predict which and when, other than there will be others. Um, just like, you know, in MicroStrategy's case, they might have been the first corporate to publicly acknowledge they had Bitcoin, but then Square followed in Tesla. Others have that likely aren't public yet, um, but that they all inevitably will. Um, but I would expect to see over the next 12 months that, you know, at least another country or two will, will take a similar stance, um, but that it will be a country that, um, that doesn't have a reserve currency. Um, you know, that, that, that the countries that, that need Bitcoin most or that can benefit from Bitcoin most are uh, countries that could opt in for the same reason as individuals do to a monetary system that isn't controlled by any, anyone else. Um, if you want to jump right into Jim's question that you would read there, and then, yeah, if you see one that you'd like to do first, please go ahead. Yeah, so on this one, I would point people to, and, and we'll share some resources after the call, but one of the articles that I wrote is um, Bitcoin cannot be copied. And, and, and what, I, what I try to focus people on here is that um, Bitcoin's open source code is open source, that anybody, I could go copy the open source code and ask people to take Parker money. But, but nobody would because that code base would say that there will only ever be 21 million, but it's coming back to this idea that Bitcoin doesn't have a fixed supply of 21 million because software code says it does, that, that anybody who, you know, whether it's Ethereum or, um, you know, Cardano, or, and I hate even using those terms because I, I find them to be um, useless uh, malinvestments, but that, but that each one of those are effectively me creating my coin and saying that it has value. And, and the key distinction is you can copy Bitcoin's code base. You can copy its design and its engineering. You can copy its idea, but you can't copy its monetary properties. That its monetary properties, that, that, that fact that Bitcoin has a credibly enforced fixed supply of 21 million, it didn't the month after Bitcoin was released. It probably didn't six months after it was, it probably didn't even a year that as the, Bitcoin network grows, it actively becomes more decentralized. And that decentralization of the network, which there is no, like, there's not even within one one thousandth of a degree of decentralization that exists in any other currency in the world other than Bitcoin, um, that that decentralization not being static and that it gets more and more um, decentralized and more and more secure is critical to this question. That that, but then you have, to, you have to pair in the fact that money converges to one, right? That we all only really need one money. And so you, you can either opt into a decentralized money that is trustless, or you can opt into a, a separate form of money and every other form of money not named Bitcoin is dependent on trust. And so 
as Bitcoin grows, it gets more and more secure, money converges to one. And if you're in that dilemma, whether it's Bitcoin vis vis any other cryptocurrency, you have to realize that each money is competing with every other money for every exchange. And they're designed to fulfill the exact same purpose. There's other cryptocurrencies that will say, ah, I'm not money, I'm gas, or I, I have this utility. But if an asset is only a utility in exchange, and it doesn't have a claim on a productive asset, um, it has to compete as money. And what you'll find is you only need one and that no two things are similar. That when you, when you start to evaluate scarcity and visibility, transferability, um, fungibility, that, uh, and that all of that only exists in Bitcoin because of decentralization, de decentralization and that the fact that Bitcoin exists, the fact that there is something with a credibly fixed supply of 21 million makes all other cryptocurrencies, practically speaking, all other currencies over the long term obsolete, that, that you don't need a second form of money. So you're, you're, you're always in that decision. Is Bitcoin more secure to carry my value in the future or is, you know, some third rate two bit, you know, 10th cryptocurrency. So when you distill it down to that point of you can copy the code base, but you can't copy the monetary properties. The monetary properties are that 21 million, the decentralization, the censorship resistant, they're all emergent, but the monetary properties are also, and the monetary network is also, you know, the infrastructure in place to support Bitcoin, the hardware wallets, the, the nodes, the, um, all the code review that's gone into it. Uh, and so I, I like to describe it as Bitcoin, if you can accept that money converges to one, that Bitcoin is running a race and it's a marathon. And it's at the 13 mile marker and you're starting at zero if you form a new cryptocurrency. And that if you develop a car to catch up to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, is changeable. It's difficult to change for a reason, but it can look at your car and say, oh, I'll incorporate that and continue to speed ahead from you. Uh, so that it's, it's not like competition between any two monies. And if you think about it like competition between any two monies, like, oh, Bitcoin's my space, you'll, you'll be evaluating the question on a fundamentally wrong plane, that you have to evaluate the difference in competition between two forms of money. And really, uh, I don't even consider other cryptocurrencies to be competition to Bitcoin. I consider gold and the dollar as the best benchmark. So we had one question that kind of multiple versions of this question came up, so it might be good to touch on. Pretty much uh, the question is when sort of sharing um, information about Bitcoin with other individuals, the most common objection that comes up is Bitcoin is too volatile. Can you maybe talk about that and maybe discuss, you know, the different um, different cycles of, you know, a new monetary um, aspect kind of coming into the market itself? That might be good to touch on for those who are wanting to learn how to share this information with others. Yeah, so I would I would I would think about the volatility question as. Uh, now versus future state. And, you know, if I go back to that equation of 10 million people have Bitcoin, or realistically 150 million people have Bitcoin, but 10 million have any material exposure to it, which I, again, you know, quantify as 5 to 10% of their assets. Uh, that imagine the next 100 million people that adopt Bitcoin. Um, so you've got 110 million people that own it but that for the first time, 10x the number of people are valuing Bitcoin for the first time. Um, and, and that those people have very limited number of, amount of information. That while I, while I highlight the signal here that it is 21 million Bitcoin and that it is money converges to one, most people when they're buying Bitcoin for the first time, they're, they're FOMOing in or they're, they're buying it for speculation. They're buying not knowing what the signal is and then people get sucked into the rabbit hole and figure out what the, what the true signal is. But just kind of thinking about the, um, the volatility question, if, if 10 million people have material exposure and that's to, to go to 100 million, that the demand has to increase by 10x. And those people who are valuing Bitcoin for the first time have uh, asymmet or they, they don't have the same level of information and they are pricing a good that is digital for the first time. And so the natural consequence of the supply doesn't change is that that will be volatile. The Bitcoin will have a dramatic rise, but then the people who bought it for irrational reasons will sell. But more and more people will find the signal through the noise. And that's why when Bitcoin corrects, it always resets higher because more people, you know, in that equation, if, if the demand increased by 10x, if only 20% of those people find the signal, 
then the base resets 3x higher because you have your embedded base plus 2x new people. Um, and, and so then I also connect in the idea that when a billion people have Bitcoin, the next 100 million will only represent 10%. And so it's again that this stability, you cannot take something that emerges on the free market and magically expect it to be stable. And so people think about Bitcoin, they say it can't be money because of its volatility, but they fail to recognize that the volatility is, uh, is a requirement for it to be adopted on a, on a global scale. And that when you get to that billion people mark, 100 million people will not represent 10x, it will represent 10%. And so it's not until Bitcoin is adopted by so many people that the incremental demand or the marginal demand only represents a small percentage that it will not be volatile. Uh, but that the volatility is natural. Now, how do you deal with that volatility? Uh, you deal with it the same way that everyone deals with all volatilities in markets, and it's by sizing the portfolio correctly. That uh, if you're start, first starting to get into Bitcoin and you start to understand, you don't understand how Bitcoin incredibly enforces the fixed supply, but you understand that that is the, the decision point or, or that, that is what you know, is, is really driving the fundamental value and is the signal to the noise. If you have 1% of Bitcoin and 99% of everything else, is your portfolio volatile? Well, if everyone approaches it that way and just allocates 1% of their portfolio to Bitcoin, they're not subject to its volatility, but through that process, it will become the standard of value and everything will be volatile around it. Uh, and so it's, you know, in, I kind of summarize it as explaining why the volatility occurs, when it will decline, and it won't decline until the marginal demand is a small fraction of the embedded base. Uh, and that in the interim, we tolerate volatility based on our level of understanding of Bitcoin. Uh, but that generally when people are new getting in, that it's allocating a percentage so that, you know, 20 percentage points of volatility or 40 percent or even 60 percent is, um, is a small fraction, doesn't impact someone's day to day. So I always tell people when they're first getting into Bitcoin that they should buy enough Bitcoin so that the price doubles. Uh, they don't feel like they made money and they'd want to buy more. And uh, similarly, if the price cut in half, that they wouldn't feel like they lost money and they'd want to buy more. Um, and that they're doing the work on a fundamental level uh, because the, the problem that's in front of us, both as individuals, local communities, state, federal, whole world, that the, that the problem of printing money is too important to ignore. Awesome. There was one um, from Michael that had just a question about your personal take on this. How do you envision the transition gradually then suddenly to a Bitcoin standard unfolding and more specifically how much pain and for how long will the global uh, economy have to endure before Bitcoin becomes the global reserve unit of account? Just curious on how you see the future unfolding. Yeah, so I really tie this to, and again, I think it's a fool's errand to, to truly predict time, but I'll lay out a framework. Um, that, that I think about directionally. It is that as a function of time, knowledge distributes and it's going to, and that knowledge distribution is going to accelerate. As more people understand Bitcoin, um, there's more people to help other people uh, understand Bitcoin. That comes through in, in writings like my own um, with Graduate and Suddenly, The Bitcoin Standard, Layered Money by Nick Batia, all the podcasts that are out there that, so that as people, as more people have adopted Bitcoin, not only have more people gone before them to contemplate these questions that it's actually an easier dilemma for the 100 million in one person than for the first 100 million um, because a consensus has already emerged on the free market. Uh, and now they're just taking with, with greater access to information. So I do expect the knowledge distribution to accelerate as well as the ease of adoption, not just because better and more infrastructure will exist, um, but that, that it's actually a function of the people that have gone before you, that the first thousand people that adopted Bitcoin, they were real crazy. Maybe the first million, they were even crazy. Um, but once you get to a critical mass, the, the incremental adoption uh, should, should and will accelerate. Um, as we've seen historically, um, Bitcoin adoption through these um, su supply shocks or each happening, that adoption generally increases by 10x in a wave. And that doesn't mean that 10x number of people all of a sudden understand Bitcoin. But if 10 million people today uh, kind of have found the signal through the noise and have material exposure, then through two cycles of Bitcoin happenings, that would get us to about a billion people in the next 10 years. Uh, and that when a billion people, because I'm also relying on the assumption that the first billion will be those that have greatest access to information and greatest amount, the, the greatest share of wealth in the world, 
that that within the next ten years we'll get to a billion dollar or sorry a, a billion people having adopted Bitcoin, and that will be enough people to shift and make Bitcoin the um, standard unit of account, global standard of value, and displace other forms of money. It doesn't mean every other form of money doesn't exist at that time, but that Bitcoin will be the predominant currency that's used for day to day transactions. I do think, and I I, I don't present like a world of a dystopian world of doom and gloom, that when people print money. Every single time the experience has happened, it's ended in tears. Um, and so I try to be realistic that you cannot shift away from an $85 trillion credit system in the United States or $300 trillion credit system globally uh, that's fueled by fiat currencies that can be easily printed to a sound monetary standard like Bitcoin and expect that there's just this easy transition where there's no pain felt. I, I like to think about the analogy that with Venezuela, Venezuela has turned into an abject disaster used to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world, uh, but it would be far worse if there weren't other functional currencies around Venezuela for people to continue to rely on, to get aid to Venezuela and to coordinate economic activity to try to reboot its system or if Bitcoin did exist. So I think about that with the developed world where you have developed country fiat currencies. If all of those went, went away or hyperinflated and Bitcoin didn't exist, the pain would be far greater. There will be a lot of people that place the blame on Bitcoin, uh, but it will ultimately be because their governments printed trillions of dollars, and and people that were solvent and and you know operating in a Darwinian world that is you know kind of survival of the fittest. It's really we are all going to survive because we have a form of money, uh, and that as that consensus emerges, whatever would have happened when the dollar credit system fell apart uh, will be far less painful because we actually have a form of money that can coordinate economic activity and it will accelerate when that occurs. But, uh, but that's just generally how I think about it as a construct. All right, great. And there's a few more questions here. I don't know how many more you want to go through, but one that did pop up that I thought might be a good conversation, and this is from Anonymous here, is how much of an impact um, will a Bitcoin ETF have on price and adoption in your opinion, or what are your overall thoughts on that? Um, so I discussed this in the Press and Pitch podcast. I think it's coming out today. Um, I, I personally don't get too excited about uh, a Bitcoin ETF. Maybe this is a good place to transition to what we do at Unchain. And then for folks who want to stay on, I'll continue to, to answer questions. Um, I, I, view the, I view the ETF, ETF as a vastly superior or inferior way to hold Bitcoin. That, that an ETF is slightly better than what is currently in the market with uh, GPTC, which is a um, a trust where their their shares are publicly traded, uh, but I think about it as an ETF has the same problem as GBTC, which is that it has multiple layers of counterparty risk. Uh, and you know, if I use GBTC as an example, which is really the only public vehicle um, trust vehicle where people can buy and sell shares in a public market, um, GBTC uses Coinbase custody. But then on top of Coinbase, you've got the trust actual counterparty risk, which is grayscale. You've got um, or, or at least you have the trust and then you have Grayscale and then you have Grayscale's parent and then you have whatever broker it is that you use that's actually holding the, those shares. And so you basically have four or five different uh, layers of counterparty risk on top of just Coinbase and you could just go and own Bitcoin and Coinbase and, um, and, ha and eliminate those. Um, so when I think about the ETF, it is, yes, Inevitably, some additional flows will come in. I, because I view it as fundamentally slightly better than a GPTC, I, I, I think that the, that the actual tidal wave is things like what our partner NIDIC is working on, where they're working to light up all the, the local and regional banks so that people don't have to go to Coinbase. But the more places that are, that are turned up to say easy to buy Bitcoin, that 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 will really be what what changes the game, and that e the ETF is just one part of that. But but really, kind of coming back to um, kind of that dilemma of like, do I buy it in an ETF? It's like, yes, I'm recognizing I used to work in um, you know work for a hedge fund. I understand that that it will bring in more flows. But what's going to bring in more flows is when Google decides to buy Bitcoin, or Apple decides to buy Bitcoin, or Facebook because they need the money in its treasury. Uh, so I, I do think that it's kind of like one of those, uh, I don't even know what the, the saying is, but it's like sell the news, like buy the rumor, sell the news. Um, that, that's probably how this one will go. Um, but coming into that idea of, of what we do uh, for those folks who are on the call that, that aren't as familiar with it, 
we help people secure their Bitcoin without counterparty risk. You know, I am a, uh, I am a creation of the financial crisis, I would say. I, I worked at Deutsche Bank in 2006 to 2009. Most people, you know, there's a saying that is markets have no memory. But anybody who lived through 2006 and 2009, even though it feels like in the distant past, when they, when they recall what happened there, they figure out that counterparty risk was real. Um, and that if the Fed hadn't printed that money, which is the express problem that, that we're trying to solve here, that practically speaking, all investment banks and the vast majority of all the mega commercial banks would have filed for bankruptcy. They would have been insolvent. Uh, and that is because of the degree of leverage in the system. And that the money printing was designed to solve that counterparty risk, but they did it at the consequence of everybody's savings. And you were forced to opt into that. Um, that if you live in a world where counterparty risk is real, and it is real because you either are exposed to it, or you have dollar exposure to the to the government printing tr- or the Fed printing trillions of dollars. That in Bitcoin, the unique things about Bitcoin is that it's permissionless, censorship resistant, and uh, and available to anybody. And so what we do at Unchain, really the, the foundation of our co- our company, and the thing that differentiates us is our approach to custody. We help people. Uh, not only accelerate their path to understanding Bitcoin, and I and I view that as, I, I do view that as something that is priceless. Like I can't put a fee on me helping people understand Bitcoin, um, but but that once they do, they will understand how unique of an asset it is, and how important to the equation both permissionless access to your money is, censorship access to your money, and the elimination of counterparty risk. And so what we do is we help people hold their own keys in such a way that eliminates counterparty risk and preserves those properties of permissionless access and censorship resistance access. And if you start to appreciate how important a fixed supply of 21 million is uh, and that counterparty risk is real, that we deliver a lot of value and power to people by giving them money in a way that they can hold where no financial institution can come between them and their money and their form of money can't be debased. So we start with education, we start with custody, we do have a concierge service, which I'll let Justine talk to for just a minute or two. Uh, we do help people buy and sell Bitcoin today. It's generally in larger amounts. Uh, we lend against Bitcoin. So a lot of our the clients who use us have a lot of Bitcoin. They've held a bit for a long time. Rather than sell Bitcoin, uh, they will take out a loan, not, not incur a tax event, uh, and use that either to fund investments or, or expenses. And we also uh, just brought in a new head of retirement inheritance uh, named Jeff Andrew, and we're uh, in the process of piloting uh, an IRA product so that people can hold their own keys with our custody solution and have tax advantaged uh, access to, to, to Bitcoin. Um, so maybe, Justine, if you want to just talk about the concierge process for just a minute or two. And this is really where it's a white glove service where we hold everyone's hands. People are new to Bitcoin. We really accelerate that path to, to private key ownership. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Parker. Yeah, so with our concierge team, we are essentially, it's designed to help you become confident while taking the stress out of sovereign Bitcoin custody. As Parker mentioned, holding your own keys is the goal, but how do you get there? So we are here to help you with every step of the process. Um, If you need hardware devices, we can order those for for you straight from the manufacturer, or you can bring your own. And we actually are incorporated with cold card, ledger, and Trezor. And then you have a private video call with one of our specialists who will help you walk through every step. So setting up those devices, sometimes people have never worked with hardware devices, or maybe don't even really quite understand what a Bitcoin key is. We walk you through every step of that, help you create your multi-sig vault, go over best practices, operational security tips, and then give you hands-on support. Um, Oftentimes on these calls, we're helping clients make their first ever Bitcoin transaction, moving funds off exchanges and into addresses they hold the keys to, which is extremely empowering. And then we're here for you after onboarding with ongoing support from the team, um, exclusive continuing education webinars like this one, as well as a team of experts available when needed. So you'll have absolutely everything you need to take full control of your Bitcoin, because quite frankly, Myself and everyone on the team believes that everyone is capable of holding the wealth to, or I'm sorry, the holding the keys to your Bitcoin wealth. And we're here to help you and help empower you to do just that, as well as, of course, being your partner in your Bitcoin wealth to help you with all of your personal business and uh, retirement needs. So really the concierge team is here, like Parker said, to walk you through every step. So if it's something that you feel confident or don't feel confident in, but want to get started with self-custody, concierge may be for you. Um, it's a really great service. And yeah, we can help you get started uh, with every step of the way. Thanks, Justine. And, and, and the last thing I'll say before, for people that want to hang out and, and ask more questions, 
uh, I'll hang out and do that. That following up on this, we'll, we'll send out this presentation. It will be on our website, but we'll send it to everybody um, that participated in this call. We'll also include a link for people to, to either sign up for a consultation or uh, for concierge for, for our existing clients. We really do view our role as, as, a, as a partnership. Nothing about how we operate is transactional. And so if you have family members or people in your network that you think would value that, we'd also appreciate you not only forwarding the presentation along, but also sharing the idea of concierge for people that either have Bitcoin on Coinbase or Gemini or uh, people that are adopting Bitcoin for the first time. So uh, with that, um, Justine, if there are still people kind of that are, that are asking questions, I'm happy to, to dive back into the regularly scheduled program. Absolutely. So let me go ahead and feel free to scan here too, because we have quite a few. So it depends on how deep you want to get into things. Um, let's see. There's a lot of kind of beginner questions. There's some questions about um, inflation concerns and um, loose policies. Do they concern you more or less and less on Bitcoin adoption? Um, one I thought was kind of interesting here that you may want to touch on, I'd actually like to hear your opinion on this, is how will the Fed convert from dollar to Bitcoin? What does that look like? And when will that become necessary? So when will Bitcoin become the global reserve of the, the Fed? Do you have thoughts on that? Um, so there's a first rule of Bitcoin that if the Fed ever knocks on your door and asks to buy Bitcoin, you have to tell all, all your friends. Um, so, I mean, I think realistically that... Uh, what is more likely to happen is that um, that the U.S. government is going to, you know, when it, you know, whether it's the colonial pipeline or, or or some other seizure of some that legal activity, that when they seize Bitcoin for an actual crime that's been committed, that they're going to continue to hold that Bitcoin, and that that will be the more logical way that uh, that Bitcoin ends up on the federal government's balance sheet. Now, that wouldn't be the Federal Reserve, but it might hold that Bitcoin at the Fed. Um, I, I do not see a world where a global central bank that has a, uh, a reserve currency will be out in the open market buying Bitcoin. Like that is the ultimate our currency is done move. And it will also be something that's incredibly difficult to hide um, and, and will only accelerate the, the, the downfall of the currency by that news being in the market. What, what was the question on awesome. inflation? Uh, let me go back to that. Um, the question was from S. Koss, and maybe they could give a little more details here if we don't answer it clearly. But do you find that inflation concerns and government um, loose policies concern you less and less as Bitcoin adoption increases? So I guess the question is, does what's happening in the governmental world of financial assets of the dollar concern you less and less as Bitcoin adoption increases, or is that still a major concern for you? I think that there is a, there's still a reality if, if, you know, Bitcoin, $1 trillion is not a small amount, you know, that, that, that's important, uh, which is approximately what Bitcoin's total real purchasing power. And, and, and practically speaking, we still, still do need to compare it to the dollar for that kind of real purchasing power, because the dollar is the unit of account, is the global funding currency, and it's our best direct connection into uh, real purchasing power. So there's a recognize, recognize, uh, we have to recognize that a trillion dollars is not small. It is significant. But global financial assets are $400 trillion. I think the global credit system is about $300 trillion, and then the global stock market is about $100 trillion. So it's still very small. Now, that, that small kind of relative size is those are the flows of funds that are going to come into Bitcoin. But Every time there, there is a global meltdown, like whether it was caused by Evergrande, imagine like the global stock market or, the, or financial assets broadly going down by 4%, that's 16 trillion of value. If Bitcoin's only worth 1 trillion, that is what causes, like when there's a liquid, dollar liquidity crisis, there's massive dollar shortage um, and people sell liquid assets. Bitcoin is a liquid asset. And there's a reality that certain people that are trading Bitcoin are probably over leveraged. Uh, but but what happens over time that impact is as Bitcoin gets larger and as the people that are actually in the Bitcoin uh, network that that actually need that dollar liquidity less and less that those kind of uh, snapbacks when there's a broader economic uh, kind of liquidity issue in the, in the global financial system um, they will become less and less and also I operate with the perspective that each time that happens. That is actually what causes the Fed to need to print trillions of dollars. 
So I kind of manage my own life. I think about Bitcoin this way is that you have to survive all weathers, that there might be interim volatility um, in, in the market, but that there is a fundamental reason why Bitcoin is held and why that won't always be the case and why the thing that is causing that liquidity crisis is also what dictates the Fed prints trillions of dollars. And that is at the direct consequence of you holding dollar denominated assets, um, partly because it deflates each dollar, but also because it disrupts the equity value or the, the impairs the credit uh, that you're actually holding at a fundamental level. Um, and so when I, when I think about the question, it's, it's surviving all weathers, it's recognizing that there will be still exposure to the legacy financial system, but over time it will become muted and, and that, that, that Bitcoin is the defense. Um, and that I, I always try to prepare myself as if, hey, tomorrow Bitcoin can go down 50%. Would I survive that world? Yes. You know, then, then I don't have enough Bitcoin. Um, and so, um, I think that until Bitcoin is larger than the base money supply, um, of other markets, like we'll continue to see that. Um, one All question right. I saw, one question I saw here that I thought was interesting is that people don't spend when there is deflation. Would def, would, would it, deflationary Bitcoin economy caused the economic engine to really slow down? I would say that, that the short answer is no. Um, and that is a, a, a line that a lot of people deal with. They, they say, we have to be able to print money because what, how else do we deal with crises? Um, they don't appreciate that it's actually the money printing that creates the crises and, essentially, and eventually you have to get off and out of that vicious cycle. Uh, but that there's also this flaw that uh, a deflationary currency isn't spent. Now, the way that I think about it is, so long as people accept my dollars, which are a depreci depreciating currency, and I understand why the entire world is about to adopt Bitcoin, that so long as people accept my dollars, I'm gonna spend my depreciating asset, I'm gonna hold my appreciating asset. But at some point, somebody's gonna come and say, if you want my gas at the gasoline station, you gotta pay me in Bitcoin, because I'm no longer accepting the form of money that is losing its value. Uh, and I need gasoline to drive my car or the same thing is gonna happen at the grocery store. So what I anchor to is imagine a world where seven to 8 billion people have adopted Bitcoin. It's the global standard of value. And there's only 21 million of it that everybody has seven to 8 billion people have demands every single day that they need to consume to survive and make their life you know, enriched and happy uh, that spending Bitcoin in a, in, a, in a world where what you are effectively doing, and I also kind of use the empirical data that when Bitcoin goes to 57,000, people are selling a depreciating asset. When it drops to 30,000, people are buying an asset that's devaluing, that the idea that Keynesians put out there that people won't spend an asset that's increasing in purchasing power, functionally ignore economic realities that people have to consume things every day. And it's actually money which causes those things to arrive. It's what coordinates academic activity. And, and the whole point of it is to spend it uh, and, because you have to spend on things to survive, either truly for survival, like water and food and power, or to go on a cruise or to take a vacation. Uh, and when it's the only form of money that people accept, you'll figure out that there's going to be no problem because it won't always be Bitcoin going up by 10x or 100x, that there will be a full monetization period where you won't notice that Bitcoin is increasing in price day to day, that, that it's only increasing slightly um, because that it's likely tied to increases in productivity, not in terms of a monetization event that's occurring. So I don't know how deep you want to get into this, but I thought this was a good question for people who are, who are out there trying to educate their friends and colleagues, right? This is going to be a great resource for them to be able to tackle a lot of the questions that come up. And one of the questions um, that an anonymous attendee was asking was essentially a lot of people come back and ask about future regulation. So do you think future regulations will shut down or just slow down the adoption of Bitcoin? How do you put a future holder's mind at ease over this topic? I imagine it would take a lot for most of us to take the risk of adopting Bitcoin in that environment of FUD everywhere you turn. So how do you address this when sort of orange pilling someone? Yeah, so I, I think about it. And also for that last question about the deflationary currency, um, the, I wrote an article called Bitcoin is the Great Definancialization. And I talk about that subject um, in, in, in that article, the, the prior one. On this I'll one- throw it in the chat. Yeah, I've got an article called Bitcoin Cannot Be Banned. But to, to summarize it, it is that there's one thing that is absolutely certain, and that is that your government is printing trillions of dollars and that the everything that's dollar denominated is impaired by a function of that money printing. 
Um, and that might not be intuitive and I don't expect people to take my word for it, but um, kind of in my series, I think particularly in uh, Bitcoin is one for all. And then also Bitcoin does not waste energy. I talk about these ideas of linking money printing to actual economic instability that, that what is unknown is how the government will deal with it. What is known is, or what is known is that the government's printing trillions of dollars and that's the problem. What is unknown is can Bitcoin credibly enforce the fixed supply of 21 million and would that be a viable solution? And that, that when you start to understand and what I really focus people on here is figure out whether or not, like first, if it were true, would that thing be valuable? Would the 21 million fixed supply be valuable as money? Then figure out, do I believe, can I, can I form a mental construct as to how it happens and is it credible? If you develop that, um, you will recognize that Bitcoin is in, like money is a very basic necessity. It, it is not a luxury. It's not like a, you know, Aston Martin or Ferrari, that, that money is literally what allows clean water, power, healthcare, food, gas. Like without a functioning form of money, you turn into Venezuela. So when I think about the government banning things, I think about it at that level. And I recognize that when the government banned gold, private ownership of gold in 1933, gold didn't cease to exist in the world. The dollars devalued and gold became more valuable. Uh, when the government tried to ban booze, they weren't able to functionally ban booze. That, that Bitcoin is orders of magnitude harder to stop by its, by its design, um, and it is fundamentally more important. So when you put seven to eight billion people that all have the same problem, uh, and that, that, that money is a very basic necessity, and that Bitcoin is the best form of money that's ever existed, that I, that I anchor to that point when I worry about anything that the government might do. Uh, that they weren't able to functionally do things of lesser value and significance, that they're not going to be able to overcome greater. Uh, and that you have a clear and present danger and that that's your government printing you money and debasing your savings and, and destabilizing the economic structure. So to me, the, the answer on, on that level is, is obvious, but that, that's really what I anchor to. But I also highlight for people that at the decision tree, it's if Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, if you come to the conclusion that that's not possible, then there's nothing for the government to ban. Um, but if it is possible and it is valuable, then there is something to ban. So it's like before you start to contemplate the question of can the government ban it, focus on how does it actually work? And because you won't have a framework to evaluate whether or not it can be, be banned or, or what position do you want to be in. Um, but then when you take it to the next level, if you say, oh yes, I, I, I believe that I understand and have a framework for how Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, then you'll also start to realize, well, when do these actions come into place? When, 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 when would the government try to, to ban Bitcoin or put some regulatory action on it? It will be when, once it's clear that, the, that Bitcoin is threatening the government's monopoly on money. And so you could have either been in the position of how is your purchasing power increased rather than be devalued in holding dollars or the opposite. And, and most rational economic actors would rather be in the position of holding that asset that has increased in purchasing power by multiples and, and been in a position and been so successful that it's credibly threatening the, the monopoly status of countries all over the world in terms of the control over the money supply. Um, and that, that, that they would wanna own that asset and then be faced to the position, just like anybody that was holding gold at that time, well, what do I do? Because the only other alternative is I was left holding the bag and I'm in the same position. I don't have the asset. I haven't seen my purchasing power increase. And I, I made the decision for myself long ago, and I'm not faced with a decision of what to do. All right, we've got a lot of really good questions here. I, I like a lot of them that are really just trying to figure out, like, how do I, how do I come back with some really informative answers to individuals who have these certain kind of common misconceptions or concerns? Um, so another one of those, which I know you wrote a really great blog series on, which I just linked, um, but the environmental argument and discussing, you know, proof of work versus proof of stake. You know, this is something that we hear a lot about. Uh, it's the it's the FUD dice that won't go away. Um, but how would you respond to someone when you're when you're in the middle of kind of sharing this information with them and they come back with maybe that issue? What would be a good response in your opinion? Yeah, so I think um, one a good response would be that um, you can send them one of my articles. Um, so that part of the reason why I wrote those articles was to help not only myself leverage my own time, but other Bitcoiners to be able to share them so they don't have to explain from scratch. Because I also find it to be that if someone doesn't want to invest 15 to 30 minutes to understand a subject, 
that you explaining it to them, it, it, it's, it's not that um, they don't want to know, it's that they're not listening. Um, and so I would have them first read an article and then discuss their questions that derive from that. Um, on the, you know, kind of the question about Bitcoin does not waste energy. I, I always come back to this idea that um, people for context, Bitcoin uh, consumes about 14 exahashes of compute power, which translates to about 14 gigawatts probably translates to like 12 million homes or at least around that order of magnitude in the U.S. based on how um, U.S. averages, average homes consume energy. They look at that number, they say, ha, huh, well, man, if we could just take 14 gigawatts of power and repurpose it to homes, we could power a lot more homes. But, but they don't question like, where are all these homes that are without power? Um, and just like in um, in China, when China banned Bitcoin mining and it in the process of shifting over to the United States, other parts of the world, particularly Texas, um, that where are all the Chinese homes that are suddenly being powered now that the Bitcoin energy supply is gone or isn't, isn't being consumed for, for Bitcoin mining? That realistically, that's not the way that energy works. Um, that, that energy is developed based on end demand. Um, and that the more you need, the more you can get, the more you can pay for, the more you can coordinate with, with, a, with a reliable form of money, the more, more you can go extract. Um, but more importantly, someone will not understand the cost to secure the Bitcoin network if they do not understand the value of it. So whenever you see somebody that says Bitcoin wastes energy, that it consumes too much energy, you have to start with, do you understand why Bitcoin is valuable? Because somebody that does not understand the, these ideas that I talked about, about 21 million, how it's credibly enforced, that it's only enforced by a function of energy and why it's a utility, they don't have the benefit side of the equation. So therefore they are, they are um, ill-equipped to be able to do a cost benefit analysis. If you don't understand the benefit, you can't make any statement on the cost because if you did that, you would say like, I don't understand why people play Xbox or why they get value from that, like cut off Xbox spending. I don't understand why people drive cars because I live in New York city. I can walk to all the places. You know, ca cars are, are a waste of energy. Um, now, realistically, most people still understand cars, but but that that's the type of thinking. So I so I always think to the point: first, understand why Bitcoin is valuable, and if you don't understand that, then you can't comment on um, on that it wastes energy. Um, the other thing I highlight for people is that um, when they start to think about how economic systems actually work, that that money is really at the foundation. That, that when I say it's a basic necessity, um, that like all things, like cars, boats, anything, you know, pipes water and waste management systems, telecom systems, everything is an invention. We're taking a resource and we're turning it into something that can be used as a higher order. Um, but that kind of, as the economic systems emerge from a barter system to one that's actually fueled by money, and that that, that, that money is actually what allows econo economies to scale and for a division of, of labor and specialization of labor to, to take shape, uh, to deliver more goods to market, that the money is actually the foundation of the economy. And, and, and that at the second order, it's energy inputs and energy outputs that for everything that you consume in your daily life, it requires energy. Uh, and I come back to this example of Venezuela, where Venezuela is one of the most oil rich countries in the world. Uh, they don't have a form of money, so they can't extract the energy resources from underneath the ground. And now they can't get water, basic health care, power to their center, city centers. So when I think about Bitcoin's energy use, because money is the foundation, that the energy that's used to consume um, and protect the Bitcoin network is the highest and best use of energy because you won't be able to get out all the other energy resources that you need to turn into whatever you might consume, plastic cups, Xboxes, you know, getting water to your house, getting power to your house, you know, having access to an iPhone and tele telephone services from AT&T or Verizon if you don't have a form of money. That the supply chains are incredibly complex. The only way they're coordinated is through the function of money. Um, and so, you know, I use the analogy of when you're on an airplane, they say, um, you know, before you put your before you put the oxygen mask on the child next to you, put it on yourself. It's first secure the monetary network because everything else is a derivative of the monetary network, and the and the the energy that Bitcoin uses is actually what's ensuring that the rest of the world doesn't turn into Venezuela. Um, the other question was on proof of stake. This is the hard one. I haven't actually written about this one, so I'll address it. Um, the proof of stake question is like you also have to understand why money converges to one always anchor back to the, the reason why Bitcoin is valuable is because it credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million. And that obsoletes all of their money because money converges to one. 
So you have to be anchored to, to that thought process. It's not that, to say you have to accept it. Those are the questions that you have to evaluate first. If you can get there, then this proof of stake versus proof of work concept kind of falls down in two areas. One, um, that proof of work works. If you understand that Bitcoin credibly enforced the fixed supply of 21 million, you will understand that proof of work is core to that equation. Um, and that for proof of stake to work, quote work, it would have to, it couldn't be better than Bitcoin. It could only do the job. It could only deliver the same benefit. You might say, well, it can do it with less cost, but, but for the utility that it actually provides, what proof of work allows Bitcoin to do is affect currency issuance and vital settlement on a trustless basis. That is working and proof of work is what it's allowing to work. Some new technology, if we were to call, call proof of stake a technology, which it isn't, and for people that don't have the context, proof of stake is a mechanism that uh, this um, cryptocurrency called Ethereum is contemplating shifting away from proof of work to based on this idea that Bitcoin consumes too much energy, but we already explained why it doesn't. Um, but that for proof of stake to work, it would need to be able to affect final settlement and currency issuance on a decentralized basis. First, Ethereum is centralized, so it already doesn't work. But second, what proof of work allows for this consumption of energy and by this consumption of energy and then the validation of nodes that aren't consuming energy, basically the entire Bitcoin network is validating all transactions and, and the energy that's consumed is what makes it really costly to the point of impossible to write an invalid transaction to the Bitcoin ledger and essentially prevents invalid transactions from occurring. Um, that that only exists because there's separation of powers in the network, that um, that you do not want the people who own the stake, the, the owners of the network also setting the rules, um, because what you get in that world is seniorage. And so proof of stake is effectively the system that we have today. The owners of the network, the JP Morgan, the Citibanks, the uh, Wells Fargo's, they control the power, they get to set the rules. That's effectively what happens in proof of stake. But more importantly, proof of stake cannot displace proof of work because it can only match the actual utility that proof of work is is delivering and the way that the bitcoin system you also have to have some humility that bitcoin is like a massive puzzle and proof of work is a, is a key column in that puzzle um, and, and it exists in a way to split out enforcement of the rules from ownership of the network so if somebody that has one bitcoin or 0.1 bitcoin is treated within the bitcoin network the same as somebody that has a thousand bitcoin uh, that can't be true um in, in, in proof of stake but but, but more importantly um, you know, just think about Bitcoin, like Bitcoin won't be, wouldn't be displacing the dollar or gold if it wasn't an order of magnitude, if not orders of magnitude better as a form of money. That new, ad new technology is not adopted because something is merely as good. And in this case, all proof of stake could do is match um, what proof of work already has done and proved to work. Uh, so it's really a fool's error. All right, thank you for that. There are some questions pertaining to just kind of Unchained Capital as a whole, some questions about the infra bill, um, some questions about Bitcoin in general from a very high level perspective. I wasn't sure what you wanted to dig into specifically, but that I wanted to ask if there was any questions that you saw you wanted to make sure and hit, um, or otherwise I could pick one out as well. Um, if there are, if there's a particularly, if there's a common question that's coming up on uh, like Bitcoin high level, we can address it, but then maybe after that we can address uh, questions about Unchain. Sure, there was just one question specifically, it was a little bit earlier from Jim, I'm not sure if he's still here, um, but Jim was kind of asking from like a conception, like what is Bitcoin? Uh, you hear about developers building on Bitcoin, I'm not sure, like is, Bil is Bitcoin a database? Um, is there a way to store information on Bitcoin? So like, that's a very, very beginner level, but it, it's here. And I didn't know if you wanted to sort of give your very Parker take on, you know, what is Bitcoin? When you're explaining it to somebody, how do you, how can you conceptualize to an individual who maybe isn't used to the technology, what Bitcoin is in a easy to understand way, maybe? Yeah, well, what, what I would say is I, I definitely... Uh, before you get into the meta level questions of like, what is Bitcoin? Because it's, those are questions best answered further down the rabbit hole um, of like, where, where are Bitcoin? Where do they live? Like, well, where is the blockchain? Um, what is proof of work? That, that those questions should really be um, kind of asked or handled because any, any explanation that I were to give of like, what is Bitcoin? Like, I, I consider it a monetary system. Um, it's a system that has a currency that, um, that's um, free from any government um, that, that, that is governed by no one. Um, and that, that 
actually includes not only a currency, but a network to move that currency around. Um, and that it's permissionless, unable to be censored because nobody controls it. Um, and that it serves as the foundation for the world's new monetary system. Um, but I would really, really tell people, because if you start to answer or ask questions below those of like, what is a node? And like, what, when you say it's a monetary network, like, wh what does that mean? Um, that, that you need more building blocks to have a conception of what the answer is. And so I really focus people to start with anchor to the dollar. What gives the dollar value? Anchor to um, what are, you know, are there certain properties that, that make something better or worse in trade? And are those objective? Um, are those the inputs that, that people evaluate when they're considering which form of money to adopt? Then, you know, kind of dig into the question of 21 million, assume that it was possible for it to have a fixed supply, then get into the you know questions about, okay, could this be money if that were true and start to evaluate its monetary properties of the unit itself before even understanding the network, then get into the how. And the how is where you, when you start to understand how Bitcoin credibly enforces a fixed supply of 21 million, you can't get to that point without starting to understand those questions of is it a database or, you know, what is it, you know, so um, that really is the progression that I would lead someone down to even get to that point. And I think what you said earlier is a great point too. You know, we, we don't all understand exactly how a car works, but we see the use in it. Uh, you know, we don't understand how our laptop is doing what it's doing, but we find it beneficial. So I do think that's a really great point to, to not always focus on the how, but the why. Um, so yes. So the questions on Unchained were more of a very general. Um, where do you see Unchained going? What's the goal in the next five to 10 years? Um, what would you like to see it grow into? And um, just an overall sort of Unchained Capital future goals question. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think about it at the fundamental level. We don't consider ourselves an exchange. We don't think about ourselves as an individual product. We think about ourselves as a partner. Um, we approach everything that we do as for people that value our approach to custody, we want to help them in their personal context, their retirement needs, their business context, um, navigate their future Bitcoin world. Um, but that when we add up the, the really the focus on the individual relationships, um, that what we want to be is the most trusted brand in Bitcoin. Um, we want to make collaborative custody the standard. I think when a lot of people adopt Bitcoin today, they go over to Coinbase. We want it to be that that everyone is holding their own keys um, and that people understand not only why Bitcoin is utility um, from a fundamental perspective, but that as they do that, they're going to be in a position to understand why custody of Bitcoin is so important. And so realistically, that goal of in order to become the most trusted brand of Bitcoin, we have to uh, help more people understand why um, self-custody, custody where you're holding your own keys uh, and in a way where you have um, eliminated single points of failure, eliminated counterparty risk, but also done it in a very fault tolerant way so that you can't uh, hurt yourself or that you would have to do four really, really uh, impractical or unlikely things to, to, to be able to hurt yourself. But that is the best way to secure your wealth into the future and that, that, that it is through the means of Bitcoin. And then on top of that, um, kind of adding value to those financial relationships by tacking on additional services. So we want to be a full suite. We want to uh, we think about ourselves as uh, as a financial institution form fit for the Bitcoin world. Uh, and the, the key distinction is we can't take our clients' money and lend it. Um, that that our, our form of custody is built built on permissionless security principles, not permission security principles, which are really um, the the core security principles in the legacy system, which ultimately allowed us to get to this point where the where the government could print trillions of dollars um, and that that system could be co-opted. Um, so that's our ultimate goal, help commercialize Bitcoin, recognize that we're one small part in a, in a much larger universe that is Bitcoin uh, and that everything is in Bitcoin's control and, and, and that we're working towards um, helping more people be able to access the benefits of, of holding and securing Bitcoin and then adding value on top. Awesome. Well, that kind of covers most of the questions in the chat. If you're okay with it, are you good to sort of start to wrap up from here? Or did you want to scan through and see if there's any others you wanted to answer? No, I'm, I'm good to wrap up. Um, I think just in summary, we'll, we'll be sharing these slides with folks. And I would appreciate, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're someone who's a, a friend or family member or colleague of, of an existing client and you're interested uh, to follow up with us, you can, um, you'll be able to email me directly, um, but that we'll also share the presentation. Um, and, and we're happy to invest 
you know, kind of pointing you to additional resources um, based on, on what questions that you might have in follow-up. But also, if you're curious about learning more about our, our solutions at Unchain and how we partner with clients, uh, we'll be sharing in that um, time to schedule a consultation with one of our client solutions team. Um, but then we'll also be sending a link of, of, to a concierge onboarding so you can read more about that and consider uh, signing up and going through that onboarding process. So um, we're here to be a partner. And then also, if you are an existing client, we'd appreciate it if you share those resources with people that you think that, that we could also similarly help. Absolutely. And I did share the link in the chat, but as Parker mentioned, you'll be receiving an email after this with a recording of the session, but also the slides and then a link to share with anyone to get that free consultation if you have other questions. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody for coming to Unchained Capital's client exclusive webinar series. Really glad that you guys are here. We do have a resource of YouTubes from previous webinars, but we also will continue to have these client exclusive webinars to sort of help you become confident and empowered in your Bitcoin wealth as far as continuing education. So please feel free to check those out on the YouTube, but also check your emails for upcoming invitations to the next one. With that being said, thanks so much for everybody's time and we will see you next time. All right, thanks Justine. Thanks everyone.